Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Life Beyond Earth, The Big Debate. I'm Louise Casella, the Director of the Open University in Wales, and it's great to see so many of you online with us today. I hope you're looking forward to hearing from our two teams. As you know, they'll be telling you where they think life is most likely to be found beyond Earth. And I hope you're ready to vote, because we want to know what you think. Will Team Mars or Team Icy Moons win your vote? Our teams today are made up of Open University colleagues, including members of Astrobiology OU. I'm as excited as you, for you as you're going to hear from a group of incredible experts. The Open University is world renowned for areas of space science and exploration research, and Astrobiology OU leads in planetary protection, space governance, and working internationally with developing countries. Astrobiology OU is a multidisciplinary research group of over 50 staff and students at the OU. Their research covers many themes, including understanding the scientific and ethical change challenges faced by astrobiology related space exploration missions. So the research can be applied to a wide range of issues, such as planetary resources, sustainability and ethical leadership, not just in space, but on Earth as well. We must consider the impact of our act that our actions have on Earth. Learnings from this research can help us reflect on ourselves and on our planet. At the OU in Wales, we're committed to encouraging this kind of critical thinking. Sharing research and knowledge through the Open Talks programme provides part of that commitment. And we hope that this event gives you the opportunity to engage and do your own thinking. We continue to work on building critical thinking skills and an active citizenship in Wales on a range of issues and societal questions. Watch out for more from the OU in Wales on this topic in the coming year. Of course, Astrobiology OU research also centres on how and where life might be found beyond Earth. And we're gonna hear a lot about that today. In Wales, we have ample opportunity to catch a glimpse at what is and might be out there. We're lucky that two of our national parks, Snowdonia and the Brecon Beacons, are awarded with international dark sky status. I'm reminded of one of my favourite pre-pandemic events that we hosted at OU Cymru, up in the Brecon Beacons, where we combined some great discussions from OU colleagues on the many planets in the solar system, along with the stargazing experience. Before the Welsh weather blew in, I think we were able to see Jupiter through the telescope. So I look forward to hearing about Jupiter's icy moons. I'm not picking a side right now, I have to say. Um, with that, it's time for you to hear the debate and start making up your minds. I wish the speakers the best for the debate. It's been a pleasure to be here. I'm really sorry that I can't stay to the absolute end as I'm representing the university tonight at the Times Higher Education Awards, where the Open University is shortlisted for University of the Year. If I could ask for your votes for that, I would, but your voting minds and buttons will be busy with tonight's contentious matters. Fortunately, I know I can catch up with the debate and the final outcomes via our Open Learn Wales site, where you can also re-watch or share this talk after the event. And now, Victoria Pearson, the Associate Director of Astrobiology OU, and your Chair for the debate. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Thank you, Louise, for that introduction, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening, and huge fingers crossed for the Open University this evening. Uh, uh, I'm Vic Pearson. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Physical Sciences. I'm Associate Director of Astrobiology OU, and I'm your chair for tonight. Um, before we start, I have some digital housekeeping points, um, so we all have a good experience. Um, as we said, this event is being recorded um, and the recording will be available to watch on the Open Learn Wales website. Um, so although you can see me and you'll be able to see the other two teams that will be debating, um, your microphones and your cameras will be off during the event and the chat function is also turned off. But we really encourage questions. So if you have any, you can put these in the question and answer bar across the bottom of the screen. English and Welsh questions are welcome, um, and we'll do our best to answer many of these as soon as you've heard the debate. Um, you can also send questions to stem-communications at open.ac.uk, and you can do this and put questions in the question and answer bar throughout the event. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, as Louise said, at various points, we're going to ask your opinion using an online poll. Um, when it's time to vote, um, the poll will pop up on your screen and you can select your answer. Um, in fact, I think maybe we'll try that now um, with our first poll. 
So if you'd like to select your answer. Okay, are we... So I think we, uh, we've already got a clear winner <laughs> at this point in time. Our poll is 28% um, of you think that life is more likely on Mars and 72% of you think that life is more likely on icy moons. I wasn't expecting that response so far, so that's amazing. Um, but so I think Team Mars have got some work to do for the rest of this event. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce you the two teams um, that, are, that are competing for Solar System Glory. Um, in the icy moon corner, we have um, Dr. Mark Fox Powell. Mark is a research fellow in Astrobiology or U, and he's a member of the School of Earth Environment and Ecosystem Sciences. Um, Mark's a planetary scientist. His research is focused on the oceans of icy moons, such as Europa, Ganymede, Enceladus and Titan. Um, and he uses lab work and field work to track how ocean chemistry and microorganisms could be transported from the oceans to the icy surfaces. Hello, Mark. Um, with Mark, we have Professor Karen Olson Francis, who is Director of Astrobiology, or you. She's also a member of the School of Earth, Environment and Ecosystem Sciences. Karen is a microbiologist and her research focuses on life at the limits. Um, Karen is particularly interested in microorganisms in extreme environments, including the International Space Station and, and environments on Earth, similar to those on other planets and moons. Hi, Karen. Um, in the Mars corner, with a little bit of work to do this evening, we have uh, Dr. Peter Forden. Peter's a research fellow in the Planetary Services Group um, and a member of the School of Physical Sciences. Peter is a planetary geologist using techniques to explore planetary surfaces, in particular the geology of places on Mars that may have been habitable in the past. Um, Peter also leads the geological characterization of Oxyoplanum, which is the landing site for the ExoMars 2022 rover. With Peter on Team Mars, we have Dr. Susanna Schwenzer, who is Associate Director of Astrobiology or U, and also a member of the School of Earth, Environment and Ecosystem Sciences. Susanna is a mineralogist who studies volatile and rock interactions, including noble gases, methane and water rock reactions. Susanna is also a member of the NASA Mars Science Laboratory science team. Just a little bit about how this evening is going to work. We're going to start with Team Icy Moon. Each team is going to spend 10 minutes presenting the evidence for why their chosen area is more likely to be habitable for life. And then we're going to do another poll to see whether or not their evidence has had any influence on your views. After that, uh, we will give the team chance to respond to what the other team has said, have a discussion and a debate around the points that they've made, and also respond to any questions that you have put either in the chat box or if you've emailed them to stem-communications at open.ac.uk. And then at the very end, we will do a final poll to see whether we declare Team Icy Moon or Team Mars as champions today. So, uh, without further delay, I'd like to invite Team Icy Moon to take the floor. You have 10 minutes um, to persuade us, or to persuade 28% of us, why ice, Icy Moons are the most likely people to places to be habitable. Okay, good afternoon. Prunhaun da, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. And it's my job over the next few minutes to introduce to you these um, weird and exciting and fascinating objects in the outer solar system where um, we believe, and it seems many of you also do, uh, are the most promising locations in the solar system to search for life beyond Earth. Now, when we think about searching for life beyond Earth, we often uh, are looking for the presence of liquid water. Now, that's because when we look at life on Earth, uh, wherever we see liquid water, we see life. Life is intimately associated with, with water. But as you look farther out into the outer reaches of the solar system where the sun's warmth is diminished, it's not a place you often think about finding 
uh, large volumes of liquid water. But now we know over the last few decades, we've come to realize that moons of the gas giant planets such as Jupiter and Saturn are harboring vast oceans of liquid water under their surface. So here's an example of five, in fact, six, if you include the Earth, confirmed ocean worlds, as we like to call them. In the outer solar system, we have three moons of Jupiter, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, and two moons of Saturn, Titan and Enceladus. Now, these all have water ice as, uh, as their surface. But once you go beneath that surface crust of ice, you find um, vast quantities of, of liquid water. And we are talking about a lot of water. So um, Jupiter's moon Europa is roughly the same size as our moon. But in its interior, it harbors a volume of liquid water greater than all of Earth's oceans combined. And you can see that really nicely represented on this um, in this illustration here. And why? What is the, why? How come these moons so far from the sun have, have all of this water? Well, the interaction of these moons with their host planet, such as Jupiter, through gravity, through the gravitational interaction, actually squashes and squeezes the moons. And that generates a lot of heat in their rocky cores. And that heat is able to keep that ocean liquid. Here's an example, this is Jupiter's moon Europa, and we can actually see evidence for this ocean on the surface through the fact that it's covered in these cracks. This is almost like sea ice cracking and shifting around and allowing some of that ocean water to come up from, from underneath. This is indirect evidence that we have these huge oceans under the surface. Here's an artist's impression of what one of these, kind of the structure of, of the subsurface of an icy moon might look like. We have an icy, icy shell, which is what we see from space. Under that, we have this liquid water ocean uh, that is experienced, and then the under that, sorry, a sea floor, which is rocky, and it's experiencing that geologic heating from tidal activity. And that actually has the opportunity to generate a lot of chemistry, things like hydrothermal chemistry that on Earth, we know supports whole ecosystems of organisms. And I know Karen will be talking about that in a bit more detail in a minute. And it's not just speculation. You might be thinking, OK, well, it's all well and good. You're thinking there might be hydrothermal vents down there. But do we have any evidence? And the answer is yes, we do have evidence of hydrothermal chemistry at these icy ocean worlds. Now, this is um, the Saturn system, an absolutely gorgeous image of Saturn taken by the Cassini spacecraft um, before the end of its mission in 2017. What you're seeing backlit here is Saturn's E ring. It's a very diffuse, dusty ring. And we know from thanks to the Cassini mission that this ring is actually sourced from the tiny moon Enceladus. The plumes, Enceladus has these eruptive plumes emanating from its south pole that feed the formation of this ring. And by flying through the plumes, the Cassini spacecraft was actually able to sniff or take samples of the chemistry of those plumes. And we know now that they're actually coming from that subsurface water ocean under the, under the icy shell. This is an artist's impression on the right and a real picture of the Enceladus plumes from the Cassini mission on the left-hand side. And the data that Cassini turned, uh, sent back has shown us uh, without any doubt that we are looking at active geological activity in the subsurface with hydrothermal vents ongoing. We have in the plumes, we see hydrogen, we see methane, we see carbon dioxide and salts. And all of these um, are features that we would expect if we have this hydrothermal chemistry that's going on deep down there in, in the icy ocean of Enceladus. So if there are two points I want you to take away from this brief introduction, it's that we know that there are vast oceans of liquid water on multiple worlds out there in the outer solar system. And that rich chemistry, thanks to geological activity, is actually occurring within these oceans today. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Professor Karen Olson Francis, who's going to tell you a bit more about what this means for the presence of life. Sorry about that, everybody. A bit of a technical difficulty is always the way. So thank you for that um, introduction, Mark. 
So before I start, I just want to remind you from Vic's introduction, I am the only microbiologist on this on this panel. So I'm the only one that studies life. So just want to put that out there. So when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about experience of what I know about, about this. So I study life in extreme environments, and I'm going to take the next few minutes to argue my case why icy moons are the best place to look for life. And when we think about the icy moons, we're not thinking about that cold surface at the surface that, that Mark talked about. We're thinking about those subsurface oceans, which are protected from those detrimental effects of the space environment. So first things first, for life to exist, it needs to have originated from somewhere. Now, for life anywhere in the solar system, there's two options for this. Firstly, it could have originated from Earth, so be very similar to the life that we know. Or secondly, it could have a, sec a separate um, independent genesis of life. Now, as an astrobiologist, to me, that is the holy grail, because finding a second genesis of life opens up a whole load of possibilities about life existing in the galaxy. So when we study life, we look at Earth, because this is where we know it's the only planet where life exists. Now, there is big debate within the scientific community about the origins of life, but using DNA sequencing from modern organisms, biologists have shown that there's tentative traces that the last common ancestor on Earth, which lived about 5 billion years ago, was an aquatic organism that originated in a extreme environment, very similar to a deep sea surface vent. Now, what Mark mentioned, that we think that these can exist in some of these subsurface oceans. And this rich chemical of soup that Mark mentioned in these vents have produced the energies which could provide fuel for many prebiotic um, reactions to form life. And these molecules are believed to be involved in processes leading to the formation of life. So reason number one why the icy moons are a good place to look for life is that we know that they have these hydrothermic vents, which is very similar to those deep seep surface vents that we have on Earth. Okay, so we potentially have an origin for life. So now I'd like to think if life actually exists there and it survives and grows. So we again, we look at Earth. And for life to exist on Earth, it has three key ingredients. It has liquid water, it has bioessential elements such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and sulfur, and it needs an energy source. Okay, well, we know from Mark's presentation that there's plenty of water on these icy moons and these subsurface oceans. And for the thermochemical modelling, we can predict that some of these bioessential elements um, predict with, uh, are available within these subsurface oceans. So the second reason why the icy moon is a good place to look is that we know that the key ingredients for life exist within these subsurface environments. So let's imagine the bottom of the subsurface ocean. It would be probably, it could be very similar to what we have on Earth. It would be dark, which isn't a problem because very similar to on Earth, life would be driven by chemical reactions. So not like uh, energy from sunlight, it would depend on chemical reactions that we know that exist in these hydrothermal events. And actually, these chemical reactions are known to hold and support a, host of a whole host of ecosystems within on, in Earth. And actually, modelling suggests the subsurface oceans, when you get away from these hydrothermic vents, that the conditions aren't actually that extreme. And they'll be very similar to that of what we have on Earth. And now when we look at Earth and we take, so we take, for example, one mil of um, seawater, we know that there's over 100 species of microorganisms that live in there. But actually, it's even more important than that. We predict there's over a trillion cells within that one mill. So that brings me to my last point. If by chance life did exist within these subsurface oceans, finding evidence of life within these icy moons would be very similar compared to that for Mars, because actually we'd be able to sample the subsurface oceans through the blooms. This would give us a clear snapshot of where life could actually could actually live within these oceans. So in conclusion, the icy moons is a much better place for us that I think for it to, for life to be found. Because firstly, it would be an in, potentially be an independent origins of life. It has the key ingredients for life. And these balloons would be able allow us to have a snapshot and easy to sample compared to Mars. Thank you very much, Team Mars. Uh, in which case, I think we now pass over to, uh, sorry, I see Team Icy Moon. Now let's pass over to Team Mars. Uh, 
I need a host to please allow my video. Okay. Bring home down. Oh, uh, well, hello, welcome to our talk. Uh, we're going to be talking to you about life on Mars and why we think that there is the best quantity and quality of evidence for life, that for Mars being where life is most likely to be, exist in the solar system outside of Earth, obviously. Just share screen. Okay, so life on Mars. We think that um, we have the reason to believe that life is most likely to exist on Mars because, as I said, we have the best and best quality of evidence. And we're confident in this because we can rely on directly seeing and sort of sensing with robotic instruments what that evidence is. We don't have to rely on any models or suppositions to be able to understand it. So we're going to look at like the things that life needs and the evidence for them that Mars has through the sort of analog of um, making a pancake. So we know that we have the ingredients on life, or for life, or that life needs on Mars. We know they're there. Importantly, we know that although as well as just having the ingredients isn't really good enough, you've got to put them together. You can't just sort of chuck them into a swimming pool and sort of hope that it works. You need a pot to cook them in. You need a pot to make your pancakes in. And we have evidence for these places on Mars, not just the sort of sniffing out the, the chemicals that might may be there. But once you've got life, you need places for it to live, things for it to do. In this case, pancakes need a table to live on, to be part of a bigger ecosystem. That's the point of a pancake, to be eaten by people. And so we have evidence of this on Mars as well, how it exists as a global system, not just sort of a place where life could get going potentially. And finally, life is most likely to be found on Mars because we have the best evidence in the way in which life is preserved. So I'm going to hand over to Susanna now, who's going to talk a little bit about these ingredients and what they taste like. Thank you, Peter. So first of all, let's think about what life needs in terms of the energy and the food. And as Peter already said, we have the best evidence and we have measured evidence from the ground of Mars. You see the Mars rover, that's curiosity here. And you see the big C for carbon and an S for sulfur. Why is carbon so important? Well, if you think about a balanced diet, you might think about some carbs, you might think about some fat, and you'd think about some vitamins, you think about some proteins, all of those molecules contain carbon. And we know that carbon is on Mars. Well, it's got a CO2 atmosphere. And some of the microbes that Karen mentioned earlier can actually use that, but not many can. So we need to look for more complex so-called organic compounds. And guess what? We've found them on Mars. The Curiosity rover has found a whole range of organic molecules on Mars. And you see an example of this little ring structure here. And the yellow is the sulfur and the white is, an, is a hydrogen. So of Karen's knops, as we call them, C-H-N-O-P-S, we already have two right there and in the right shape and form. Now, on the next slide, you will see something else. And that is the rocks of Mars, because you don't only need carbon and sulfur, you need a lot more. And I am holding something into my camera here now. And that is, you see the green and olivine, and you see the gray, a basalt. This rock is from Earth, from Lanzarote, to be honest. But exactly rocks like this you will find on Mars. And if you see the slide next to that rock, everything that is gray in these little circular diagrams would be rocks that look like this. These are the original rocks on Mars. And when water comes in contact with these rocks, the next thing you get is so-called alteration phases, clay minerals. That's what you find in your garden, what keeps the plants alive on a dry summer day. But you also find red Mars, the hematite. And if I get this to focus, here you go, you see something red. And that is what the red wedge is, 
in these diagrams. So we have measured with a Curiosity rover, not only the rocks that were there, the rocks that are there, there now through the alteration with water, we can also take the process that got them there. And that's what life will have exploited while all these processes were going on. And where they are going on, that's Peter's job to tell you now. got to have somewhere to put them together. You've got to have a pan to put them in. And one thing that Mars has is it's the evidence for those specific locations. So on the screen in front of you, you can see a small volcano. This volcanic cone is likely to have formed uh, in a lake. Um, and in fact, if you look carefully in the middle, you can see this sort of little bright white mound, if you will. This is one of those hydrothermal vents that Har Karen was speculating about forming in icy moons. This is a place on Mars which, given the correct technology, we could go to, take a sample and investigate what is preserved in the minerals there. The water that produced this um, deposit here, a combination of the heat from the volcano and the groundwater from the deep subsurface, would um, be the ideal location for life to exist and to thrive exactly the same way as on Earth. And in fact, this comparison to Earth and is one of the sort of other reasons why Mars is most likely to be able to have had uh, life and to have life. Here you can see um, three impact craters. Now, this is the process where something from space, a rock from space, crashes into the surface of the planet. Mars has many, many of these. And we also know that early Earth had many of these. In fact, early Earth and early Mars were, in fact, incredibly similar in many, many ways. Um, and as we're all well aware, as we're sitting here chatting about this, Earth has been a great place for life. And so it stands to, to reason that early Mars would also have been able to support and for life to have formed. These impact craters also provide good habit, habitats for life to live in. They're kind of a nice pre-made house with access to the surface and also the subsurface. Um, where you can get all your ingredients that life needs to keep going and thriving through time. And Susanna is going to tell us a little bit about that, what goes on inside uh, impact craters underground. Thank you. So on this slide, what you see here is an impact crater. So where the uh, color ends on the left, you would have the crater rim. And where the water ends on the right, you would have the other crater rim. And what you have in the middle is the so-called central uplift, these two little triangular peaks. In the left part of that diagram, you see the colors. You see the minerals I showed you. They are the same colors of what I showed you in these little round diagrams earlier, hematite and clay produced by the reaction of rocks. But if you look on the right side, you've got the water and you've got the transport, you've got all those mechanisms. And that is very important too, because as we know from our own house, you need to get the food in and you need to get the waste out. And that's what these water flows do for you. And the impact craters are very important for this reason that they would have right after they formed, provided that system of hot water in the underground flowing and a good house to live in with the food and everything in place but they are also depressions. You saw that on Peter's slide, which collect all of the evidence and where we can now go and find that evidence. Back over to you to show some how frequent they are. Okay, so here we are. This is uh, an image that shows what the surface of Mars looks like uh, on, on the right hand side. And here you can see a variety of these sort of circles. These are the impact craters. But you can also see lots and lots of areas which look like trees the, and look like rivers. And this is the direct evidence that the water is there on and has been on the surface of Mars. There is a lot of talk about water, obviously water entirely crucial for life. And Mars has had a huge amount of water in its you know, active activity going on throughout its history. You can see here the rivers. And there is also good evidence that in fact most of Mars has had uh, seas in it on it in exactly the same way as Earth does today. This means that there's a good amount of water, but not too much. You're not flooded by water and you only have one sort of type of place to live. But across Mars, this means there's lots of different environments for life to live in. 
lots of different in, uh, environments, different habitable niches, and a whole sort of set of cycles to drive uh, the processes that life needs to you know, thrive. Finally, just to sort of summarize, we can sort of see that on Mars, we have the ingredients we need. But importantly, those ingredients come together in specific places. We don't need to just say we think those places might exist. We know where they are. They can hold the ingredients together and so that life can do the chemistry that it needs in a, in a little pot. We've got places to, for it to thrive and live afterwards. But perhaps most importantly, in terms of finding life and finding evidence of life, we don't need to sniff some chemicals from a distance. We can actually go there and find out. So this is sort of like the, the fridge, the, the deep freeze of our, our pancake life, when we want a pancake, but in a few weeks or a few uh, many, many years time. This is an image of a edge of a lake, which we know existed in uh, on Mars. Um, and this is currently being explored by two robots. And Susanna will briefly tell you about this. These robots which are going there, opening the fridge of Mars and picking out the frozen bits of life to, to tell us what's been going on. So with a picture of Jezero Crater that Peter showed you uh, a second ago, that's the Mars 2020 rover, which has just begun its scientific mission and taking its first sample. And those samples will actually be returned to Earth so that we can look very closely at them with everything that we have on Earth. And on the left, you see the Mars Science Laboratory rover, which is exploring the Martian surface for uh, over nine years now. And we will have ExoMars going in two years time, well, next year actually, um, and ExoMars will be drilling deep to see beyond that harsh surface that the other two rovers are rolling across and see into the underground to find out what is actually there. And as I said in the beginning, we already found all the ingredients. Now let's see if life is actually there. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our two teams there. Um, in a moment, we're going to um, take another poll um, and the two teams will have the opportunity to respond to each other's uh, evidence. Firstly, I'd like to remind you all that um, while we've got quite a few questions coming in, if you'd like to have your questions answered, um, please could you put these in the question and answer box um, in Zoom or don't forget to email to stem communications at open.ac.uk and we'll try and make sure that the two teams are able to answer your questions. Um, so before we move on to the uh, rebuttals from the two teams, I think we're going to do another poll. Uh, so again, when the poll appears, if you could please uh, click whichever one you think is the you've been most persuaded by so far. So we have, we have a slight change. Um, I think our last poll, we had 28% of you thought that um, life was more likely to be on uh, Mars and 72% of you thought it was the icy moons. We have the Team Mars are coming up the, um, coming up the side here and we've got them on 39% now and our icy moons team on 61%. So um, Team Mars, you were actually able to persuade a few people there. Um, so let's see whether or not um, you can persuade a few more as we now start with the um, the answers to each other's. Um, we're going to do this free form, I think. So um, uh, perhaps we could ask whether the Icy Moons team would like to come back on anything first since you went first in the presentations. Well, I personally think, you know, if we did find life on Mars, how do we know that it's not just a contamination from Earth? How do we know this? You know, I think we know that life can be transferred from one planet to another. We, we believe that. And if we had, you know, life on Earth, we take we go to these missions and on the surface of Mars, we could cause we could pollute this with with microbes that we take there as part of the missions. I mean, that wouldn't be such an issue for when we think about the icy moons, because it's we're sampling the, the, dub, the, the subsurface through the plumes, potentially. So that's something that we need to think about is how do we determine if it's contamination? And I think what's most exciting about looking at the icy moons is we'll be looking at probably at active cells. I mean, who wants to look at dead cells? You know, you look at the surface of Mars. It's so 
it's it's so detrimental to life you just look they're talking about dead cells and i just think personally that looking at live living cells is such an more of an exciting prospect than searching a dead planet where we may find evidence of microbes from millions of years ago but my first question would be is that contamination from earth so yeah over to you team mars to answer that well, yeah, the um, Mars might be a very dead and harsh surface. And that is our advantage here, because anything that we would have brought is long dead and probably dispersed and destroyed by UV radiation. So you wouldn't find that anymore. The only thing that you can find is in the subsurface. And the Curiosity rover has shown that even if you just drill six centimeters, that's this bit, uh, you find gray rock instead of red rock. So that gray rock is much more protected. It's not so oxidized. So, and we see that the organic um, components increase there and get more complex when you take the sample just a little bit from the subsurface, but that's not where spacecraft samples would get. However, I want to say the icy moons are very, very far away. We have active instruments, a laboratory. We have sample return on Mars right now. So if you ask me, where are we going to find life? It's on Mars because we've got the instruments there. We've got the spacecraft there and we are getting the samples back and we can investigate them here on Earth in all of our laboratories. And in that sense, I would think it's much more likely that we fin find it there. Susanna, you've been there for 30 years and you've not found anything. Because we have, haven't got samples back. This is what I was at a point I was going to raise. It was mentioned by Peter and also now by Susanna that they've had these missions, many, many missions going and exploring different regions and a quantity of evidence of them in Mar at Mars. But actually, and you, that could be flipped on its head. And, and the fact that we've had these missions and we still don't have the evidence uh, for life. And, and in fact, the, the organics that Susanna mentioned it's taken a long time and, and to, to actually find these. They're predicted to be there, but in fact, it's taken a long, long time to actually find them. Whereas the, the small amounts of evidence we do have from the icy moons, such as Enceladus, have massively tipped the dial in favor of an environment which can actually support life in the present day now. Um, not billions of years in the past, but actually now. And we're at the point with um, Enceladus where people are actually performing calculations based on the amount of energy available for life there how many cells we might expect to find in the ocean. You know, we're talking about, will it be a billion cells per milliliter of ocean water or a million or 10 million? You know, we're at that point where we're starting to try to understand and predict biomass. Um, whereas on Mars, you know, we're really, we're still kind of hunting for the traces of, of ancient organics, which um, are not actually as, as readily available or readily detected as we thought they might have been. One could suggest that you could make those same calculations on Earth, on for Mars, but unfortunately, there's enough contextual evidence that sort of would force you to constrain it. You haven't, whereas on the icy moons, there's evidently such a, a space of unknown that you can just sort of try and make these calculations with what's available. You suggest that um, the not being able to find evidence for it, despite so many years of exploration, is a sort of a problem for Mars. There's somewhat of a spurious argument in that. If you're going to go somewhere and look somewhere and look for something, you need to be taking the right equipment. You can't accuse the person from go, go, uh, the person a person for going somewhere before without the correct equipment of not being able to find something they weren't designed to look for in the first place. So as we move forwards in Mars exploration, they've been hunting more and more carefully to build up the understanding of the story, to understand the context of where to actually go to look for life, to be able to find the good evidence. Which kind of leads on to the, the Exxon Mars mission, which will be launching in uh, 2022, which is specifically designed, has instruments specifically tailored to look at uh, finding evidence of life and the evidence it would leave in the leave the leave in the organics in the subsurface. And so, going to where that's going is hopefully going to be somewhere that where we'll be able to uh, find that evidence within the constraints of technology available. 
these calculations about the cells have actually been done for Mars with a lot of evidence because we can take actual Mars rocks. We don't have to make assumption of what might be there. We can use the spacecraft data and then calculate if we add the water of which Peter has shown you evidence for, what are the reactions? And we see the reaction products also in situ on Mars measured by the spacecraft. And we can calculate that about 10 to the 13 cells per cubic centimeter of rock could be sustained here. But how are you going to determine that it's not related to, you know, if we did find life on Mars, that would be great. But the chances of it being a different origin and actually really opening up our minds to possibilities about finding life elsewhere in the galaxy, the universe would be immense. But we would never know that with Mars, really, because we'll just, it, it could be what it is on Earth, you know, because rocks are transported between Mars and Earth. So I just want to know, Susanna, you know, we could have all those evidence, but we, and it could support life, but it just might be something that you, you know, a contamination from Earth or, you know, how are you going to prove that it's not? We might actually find our common ancestor on Mars. How cool would that be? because Mars is a smaller planet than Earth. So Mars would have cooled quicker after the formation of the, all the planets and would have had the ability to host liquid water before Earth. So we could have the origin of life on Mars and then it gets transported to Earth, which is actually much more likely than the other way around. Because if you remember Mark's slide, Mars is further outwards from the sun than is Earth. So gravity, if you chip a piece of Mars off by one of these gigantic impacts, that piece would actually be drawn on circles further inwards to the solar system because the sun is the biggest gravity well. So it would cross Earth's path. And so the contamination from Mars to Earth is much more likely. And we know it happens because we have Martian meteorites here. And therefore we could all be Martians because Mars is smaller and has cooled earlier. I just want to bring it back to what we, what we know is happening now. And when we look at Mars, what we see is a surface which is extremely hostile to life. It's very, very oxidizing and oxidized. Now, this is a, a, a it's, everything's kind of fallen into a chemical well, effectively, and reached an equilibrium. Now, this kind of equilibrium is absolutely the enemy of life. What we really want is disequilibrium, gradients. That is the stuff of life. And that is what we know, we have direct evidence, is in the present day, um, exists with it with at the icy moons like Enceladus and I, I realized that in the distant past Mars may have been much more like the earth but then we're in a game of trying to understand that distant past and even on the earth you know as we look further and further back in time we get less and less certain about what we're looking at so if really what we're doing here is trying to kind of um, tip the dial one way or another I think we've got to look at um, what we see in the present day now because that's what we can be sure of uh, of our, in our measurements as we go further back in time we kind of lose some of that certainty um uh, which is what we're doing on mars well as a geologist i tend to disagree because we have deciphered the entire history of life on earth from paleontology which is studying the past and the rock record. So I think we have a good handle and a decade, um, century long understanding of how to do that. We are all geologists, well, except for Karen, but uh, in that sense, we all know how to do this. And Peter uh, does a lot of stratigraphy on Mars and actually knows how to read that book that the rock record of Mars presents. Being able to read and see the evidence is something that you have on Mars that you just don't have if you're looking through an icy crust that you can't see through. Um, we can go to hydrothermal vents on Mars. We could go to Nili Patera. We could go to Nili Tholis. We could dig up a bit of silica uh, and that's been deposited by water or, and in a hydrothermal system. That's just not possible on an icy moon until we have the technology to go you know, in submarines to the ocean floor, assuming that the ocean floor is even in contact with anything rocky. And assuming that even that, that ocean floor has still got enough reactions going on to provide provide the you know chemicals for life in the long term, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually have to beg to differ because I think we can actually uh, we can sample direct pretty much directly now. I, I think this is very much a serendipitous discovery that Cassini made these massive plumes emanating from Enceladus, but we know these are being sourced from the ocean, and the fact that we have 
the chemicals I mentioned, we have hydrogen and methane and carbon dioxide. These really only form when you have that water rock uh, interaction going on. So even without having to, to have a submersible and uh, dive down to the ocean floor, these oceans are actually being spilled out into space in a way that's just ready to go and capture them and sample. And we, we very much think that something similar is happening at Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, and there's a couple of missions launching within the next two to three years to go and explore Europa. And they're equipped with instruments to do exactly what we did at Enceladus, which is capture plume material. And, and we'll be able to, to probe or study that subsurface ocean um, without actually having to land or anything. So you're saying you can smell the pie, but you can't eat it or buy the rest of it. But you can't do that for Mars either. And it's a little bit narrow minded saying just because we haven't been there and spent the money that we spent on the Mars missions to go to these icy moons, that there's no life on the icy moons. So I think we have to be careful because we are kind of comparing two aspects here. M Mars has had its day. We've been going there for the last 30 years and found nothing. What we're saying is let's be open minded about this and follow the evidence and look somewhere else and maybe look at start looking at the icy moons as an option. And I think what we're saying is that we should, you know, look at other opportunities and not just put all what are. Uh, all our eggs in one basket like we seem to be doing with Mars at the moment. OK, before there's a rebuttal on that one, I've got a question relating to this um, from Stephen. So this is a specific question for Team Icy Moon. In your opinion, which of the planets or moons would you ex explore further if you had only one choice? Which is a great question when budgets for space missions are high and opportunities are low. I'll let you take that one, Mark. Sure. Um, I think given the current state of information that we have, I think the answer has got to be Enceladus, just because we know, as I've said now, this is the third or fourth time I've said it, we know that we have this chemical disequilibrium there in the ocean. We know we have hydrothermal chemistry going on. Um, in fact, one thing I didn't mention, which I, I will now will, is that also in those plumes, we have detected large, complex organic molecules. Now, this is something that has never been detected on Mars, at least not, not nowhere near the complexity of these molecules. So the fact that they exist on Enceladus, they, they may not be biological, but it shows that there's a chemistry, a, a process going on in that ocean, which is generating these complex organic molecules. And I think those lines of evidence really, um, that, that, that's where we've got to go next. Um, thankfully, we don't actually have to make that decision because as I mentioned, we have missions going to the icy moons of Jupiter. Uh, in the next decade. Um, so hopefully they'll be followed up. We'll find a lot more about um, Europa in the coming years um, and maybe a mission to return to Enceladus. But I think given, given our current information, I would choose Enceladus. Thank you, Mark. You mentioned organics there and we have a question which I think I'll direct to Team Mars here around um, organics. The question comes from Mariam. It's how, if we've discovered organics at both places, but not a structure that we might be able to call life. What are we doing wrong or what are we not doing? Peter? Um, this, I think, looking in the right place. So something that was mentioned earlier about was about the, the present day inhospitable nature of the Martian, like upper surface. So, you know, the rocks on the ground. Um, and they're right, absolutely. We've not found those sort of complex organic molecules. In fact, we wouldn't expect to be able to find them, given that what that environment is currently like. So to make a sort of more like for like comparison about finding organic molecules that would have that kind of complexity, where on the icy moons you'd be your sort of, I mean, at Enceladus at any rate, potentially sampling things that from the deep subsurface. It's important to then look in the same kind of place for Mars. So that's where the ExoMars mission comes in again. And the key part of that is that it'll have a drill which will look at organic matter in the samples taken from up to two meters below the surface. That's a place where the, the surface environment of the radiation and you know, unfortunate chemicals that are there are no longer affecting uh, you know, what's going on. So that would be where we are going to be looking to find the evidence of those complex organic molecules. Okay, to add to that, Suzanne? Well, if I could, I could add a few uh, things, the SAM instrument is measuring with GCMS. For those of you who know a little bit more about technology, it's a an instrument that takes apart uh, in a stream of um, chemical substances what comes in in the in the beginning and measures one by one. Uh, by size, separated by size, what comes out in the end. And we are actually finding quite complex, not as big 
as um, on the icy moons, but quite complex organic structures. But as Peter said rightly, so we are fairly close to the surface where they might have been broken up. Our advantage is we see them as a whole and not after they've crashed into a spacecraft. So we know exactly what was in that sample. And what we found is that we have ring structures, uh, benzenes, and I showed in the beginning on that slide, a ring structure with a sulfur in. So it is a large complexity of different things. Why we haven't said we can directly attribute them to life is because you have to be extremely careful to make that call when you have only one strand of evidence. To quote the famous Carl Sagan, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, but also extraordinary claims uh, need extraordinary evidence. So if we only have one line of evidence so far, that means we need to keep looking. We need to keep looking for more details because we would have an absolutely extraordinary claim here. So what we need to do is we need to get that two meter deep, deep drill and we need to get the samples back here. And we've worked for 40 years on this and we are just now just about there to get all the evidence. On the uh, topic of that um, drill, um, if you're comparing like for like in terms of environments, and um, I agree, you know, that's a fair thing, fair way to play it. And certainly the subsurface Mars is like more likely to be habitable than the surface, which is very inhospitable. Um, but of course, in terms of ease of detection, we have a mechanism at the icy moons that is just giving us samples. We don't even have to land. So no drills, no, um, wondering if our drill is going to get stuck in the ground and end up anchoring our rover to a, a point on Mars's surface or anything like that. We can just fly past, capture material and carry on the mission and do that over and over and over again, just like Cassini did. I would say that's what explosive bolts and the spare, dr spare drill bit of call, but that's probably, I, but I see your point. But then you don't know where they come from and where they are formed. Well, if we are drilling, we have the um, we, we have the wisdom instrument, which will map the subsurface and we have all the geochemical evidence. So we know what the habitat, what the environment looked like. And we have all the context to our observation. And uh, that will be highly valuable to interpret what we see, because an organic molecule, as I said a, a moment ago, an organic mo molecule is just not enough, but we can actually characterize it all and all together. And then a couple of years later, we will get some actual samples from Mars and we can look at them in much, much more detail. But Susanna, when you're looking at Mars, you're looking at small pockets of water rather than a big subsurface ocean. So you're, everything's going to be quite isolated. So you'll have a limit of, 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 of available food or energy that a microbe could utilize. So you're kind of having these closed systems rather than a big open ocean system where you're going to have a load of biomass. So actually detecting microbes in those small systems due to the amount of energy and the Gibbs free energy and the calculations of biomass that they could use, we're very limited. So I think the techniques, you know, with, with the drill and the FDIR that you'll be using, I think it's been very challenging for you to be able to detect life in those environments. Well, we need That's the geologists really first who need correct. to tell us where the environments actually are. Mars definitely had a well integrated and far reaching hydrological system, a, a global hydrosphere. There's ever good evidence for long standing interactions between a variety of habitable niches, not just small pockets. You've got craters connected to groundwater systems, craters connected to uh, flu river systems that have built up over tens of thousands of years, depositing into oceans and cycling through the uh, atmosphere and stuff. And, and, I, I understand that, Peter, but what's the chances of your drill actually being able to find and, you know, drill through the sides of a crater? You know, I just think we also need to be a bit realistic about, no, do you really think you're going to be able to high because the geologists know how to map all of this and to know where all of this was, even if it's four billion years ago? Uh, we have a related question here. I'm going to interject. It's a related question specifically for the um, the icy moon team, which relates to perhaps the opportunity to drill into an icy moon in future. So how might you be able to do that, given that sounds like it would be the best method to find out whether or not there's life beneath the ice? How would you do that? Should you do that? Karen, would you like to take that? 
I'll let you take that, Mark, because your expertise. <laughs> sure. Well, um, I think there's a bit of crossover because, first of all, um, it is very technically challenging. There are some groups in the over the, uh, international groups working on strategies to do this. I think the best, possibly simplest way would be to use a, uh, a probe, a melt probe, as it's called, something that gets hot and gradually buries itself in the ice. Take a very, very long time to get down. But once it is down, it could potentially uh, sample the, the ocean fluid itself. And um, by leaving a kind of cable through the ice, this is what people talk about. It might be able to transmit data back to the Earth. But actually, we don't need to do that because even at places like Europa that we haven't yet really visited um, in any detail, we can see that there is, the ice shell is overturning and um, delivering material from the subsurface, the ocean, up to the surface over probably geological time scales. But their material from that ocean is getting frozen into the ice and gradually brought up. It's a little bit like Earth's crust. I mean, you think about the crust of the Earth. It has um, tectonic activity where you have uh, plates moving around, you have volcanism, and we use uh, samples of that we see on the surface to study um, processes going on in the deep earth. So it's very much like that, but um, transferred over to ice and water and low temperatures. Um, so we can actually, we don't need to drill. We can just go to locations where we see recent exposed um, subsurface materials and, and go and study that directly. But they will have taken their time to get there. And you've got the same space irradiation problem that we have, minus the atmosphere. It's been on Mars, but it protects us just a little. Sure. But the, 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 the useful thing about, the first of all, the time aspect is that um, we're really cold. I mean, it's frozen into ice. So it's a very, very stable environment to preserve things like DNA and proteins and organic molecules over, you know, very, very long periods of time because we're super, super cold. Um, in terms of radiation, that is a problem, especially at Europa, because we have a lot of radiation going on there. But you can actually avoid it by targeting certain regions of the surface, such as the, the leading hemisphere. So Europa is locked to Jupiter tidally. So it has one side that's always pointing in the direction of travel and one side that's always pointing away. And the back side, the, what's called the trailing hemisphere, is bathed in radiation, whereas the, the leading hemisphere is not. But also, as we learn a bit more about the uh, geologic history of that surface and how that ice has cracked and moved, uh, we will find locations that are much, much more recent, uh, much more recently exposed than others. And that's where we will go and target with a mission like the Europa Lander, which is in uh, development right now in the US. So I've got another question here, just to slightly cha change direction. And this one is for both of both of the two teams. Um, what, what do you think, which of the two uh, areas would have the most stable long-term energy source? Who would like to come into this first? Uh, Team Mars, would you like to go first this time? Sure. I mean, Mars is a planet. And in that sense, it has a geothermal gradient, which means it gets warmer and warmer the deeper you get, which means we still have liquid water on Mars in the pores. It's just currently not accessible with our technology, but we still have the energy and the warmth from planet formation. And we still have things such as methane spikes, which talk for geologic activity. The InSight mission records uh, Mars Earth, Martian earthquakes or Mars quakes, however you want to word them. And so uh, Mars is still geologically active. It will still have its energy sources. The rocks are still there. The water is there. We just don't see it because it's in the underground. And therefore, we've got 4.5 billion years of Mars history to deal with here. Uh, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> I think this is an area that... Um, a area where Mars falls down quite quite a lot because what we ha we have strong evidence that Mars has dramatically changed over its history. It may well have been much more similar to Earth in the distant past. Um, there may well have been um, very connected hydrological water cycles on the surface, um, but now it's dry, it's cold, it's frozen. It's the the atmosphere has disappeared. We have evidence that the core that the, that geothermal gradient has decreased. Mars has cooled, um, it's, the surface has become oxidized, everything's kind of slowed down and gradually um, stopped over, over this long period of time. 
Whereas if you look at places like Europa, for example, and Moon of Jupiter, there's actually fairly good reason to believe that this has been in its current sort of stable orbital configuration for a long time. Things might have moved around a bit, but that flexing, that tidal input of heat to the interior, that is that could potentially have been happening throughout the entire history of the solar system. And um, the, the system, the, the, the processes going on in Europa today could, be, could have been present for billions and billions of years. Um, whereas you can't really say the same thing for Mars, where everything kind of shut down, all the, all the really kind of crazy, fun, uh, potentially habitable activity would all kind of shut down by about maybe 3.7 billion years ago. Team Mars, would you like to come back on that point? Well, mostly true. It's been, the, the geothermal gradient definitely is shut down over a long period of time. I think that then sort of begs to be clearer on the question and about whether life would have started or whether where life would exist today or where life, you know, and how it moves around the solar system. I think that the, the geological activity in the early part of Mars is indeed very much like us. So you've got a very good chance of life having formed there to start with. And then the argument comes in that you made about the coldness of the ice shell, because yes, the, the direct surface of Mars is currently oxidizing, but even just a centimeter below the surface, you have gray rocks and you have non-oxidized rocks. So you would preserve the evidence there, just as you made the point, uh, radiation just doesn't destroy everything on the icy moons. So related to this, we've got a question, which is um, how long would it take for life to evolve? Uh, and I, specifically for the icy moon team, how old are the icy moons? Um, either team can answer that first question. So I think life is always evolving though, isn't it? I think, um, are you talking about from an origin of life perspective, from the prebiotic molecules through to, to life itself or? I'm not 100 um, sure. Sorry. Yes, that, the answer was the question was was how long does it take for life to evolve? So, however you wish to answer that one, Cara. I mean, we're looking over. You know, I think as. I mean, I think it all depends on the different environments that we're looking at. And I think, you know, if we take, for example, the icy moons and the hydrothermal events, it'd be very, it would evolve in a very similar manner, potentially, is what we'd predict to happen with, with Luca on Earth and these hydrothermal environments. So, we, you know, we're looking over kind of geological timescales for it to, to occur. Um, I don't know how old the icy moons are, Mars. I'm going to put that question to you as our planetary science experts there. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned before, the Jupiter system, um, things may have moved around a little bit, but uh, it, there's no reason to think that it, it's any younger than the solar system age, really. So we're looking at kind of four and a half billion years, potentially, that we've had an ocean on Europa. Uh, when we look at Saturn, things get a little bit interesting because at Saturn, um, and this is an evolving story. I don't mean to use the word evolving as in terms of life here, but just, I mean, the story is changing. The, the debate is ongoing, really, as to, as to how the Saturn system might have changed in the recent quote, geologically recent past. Um, it's possible that Saturn's rings might be quite young, in which case something happened to form those rings and um, things might have moved around. So maybe Enceladus, the moon I've been mentioning a few times, might not be, have might not have been doing what it's doing now with these plumes and everything for the whole age of the solar system. But if not, then I think it actually gives us a really, really interesting opportunity to go and study um, a world that might be at that transition point between uh, non-life and life, where, you know, as Karen was mentioning, these kind of hydrothermal events where we think life may have originated on Earth. We think on Earth it, it might have happened within a few hundred million years, as there's evidence of, of, you know, fairly controversial evidence, but evidence of life potentially on Earth a few hundred million years after its for formation, uh, up to maybe a billion years. So, we have the opportunity with Enceladus to go and study those kinds of processes um, in, in their kind of transitionary stage. And maybe that's what we're seeing with some of these really complex organic molecules. Um, we just don't know at this point. It's uh, kind of an open question there with Enceladus. So we've got uh, to go back and see. That's, that's interesting. So you're saying that Enceladus doesn't have life yet. Anyway, um, I had kind of a follow-up kind of question. I was just wondering how you say that Europa has been around for probably most of the time of the solar system. Um, and but it is relatively relatively small. 
Um, in the same way that Mars' you know, geothermal gradient has you know, you know, waned because it's kind of a bit small, how long could the actual sort of geochemical energy reservoir on um, Europa actually sustain life, given it's been continually ground up, mushed and reacting with the ocean? How long till the food run would run out over seven billion, over four billion years? That's a really good question. Again, it's something that we need we need a bit more data to answer, but I think there's a really good a reason to believe for two so for two things. The the rocky core of Europa um, is very likely not um, completely interacting with that water. So you have a, a zone uh, where you have the ocean and the rock interacting, and because of the geological uh, heating through tidal heating in the interior, uh, you may have some kind of recycling of that rocky surface, a bit like you do on Earth with plate tectonics and volcanism, and that would produce fresh rock that could then react with that ocean uh, above it. But there's more to the story because Suzanne has mentioned the radiation environment at Europa's surface. Um, there's, on the surface of Europa, there's constant um, production of chemicals like uh, oxygen and um, other forms of, of oxidized chemicals, even sulfate, which is a which actually originates from Jupiter's moon Io and is delivered there. And, you know, all of this is on the surface, you're, you're probably thinking, what does it have to do with the ocean? Well, as I've mentioned, that that ice shell is overturning gradually over geologic time. And this these chemicals from the surface generated by radiation can make their way down into this into the subsurface. So it's possible that at Europa, you have this constant replenishment of oxidants that could actually fuel aerobic metabolism for biology, um, almost like we do have on the oceans of Earth. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask one quick question and then a, a, a more thought-provoking question for, for you to all end on. The quick question relates to the ingredients for life at hydrothermal vents. How are you, how are you sure that there might be ingredients for life there? This is a question from Silvio. Um, specifically for the Icy Moons team? I suppose it's based on what we, we know about hydrothermal events on Earth. So we know that there's a DC, DC chemical disequilibrium that occurs there. And we know from that that they have a whole ecosystem of microbes going on there with microbes that use sulfur and iron and all these different chemical um, gradients that they can grow on. So what we, 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 you know, we're using that kind of model to predict that. And from that, we can work out that there could be, it could support a whole load of chemolithotrophic, which are microbes that like to eat chemicals um, to, to, to produce energy. And that's kind of what that whole idea is based on. And because we know these hydrothermic systems exist on earth, and there's been a lot of work done in them in the last 20 years, we kind of can see what kind of ecosystems that could be developed there. So that's kind of where the whole concept of this happens. And then once you start that, you kind of seeding the oceans with this community, because it's an open system, you're then starting to get these ecosystems developing over these temperature gradients and other gradients that are going on within the oceans where, which can support this life. So, yeah, I think from that perspective, it is a whole, it can open up, you know, if we have that happening in these icy moons, we're basically, you know, you could have this whole ecosystem of microbial organisms growing there. I guess we have an advantage at Mars here because we know that this exists on Mars and when it gets into contact with water, we can actually measure what happens. I would say the same thing. You can say for Mars, you could say all of the things that Karen has said, speculative eating on the possibilities, um, but you could actually Point to somewhere to go to look. So I would suggest you'd go to the place called the Iridiania Basin, where the chemistry suggests. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lisa, can I just, sorry, just to say, you're not going to get the same amount of disequilibrium chemistry from a rock interacting with the water as you would with a hydrothermal event. So the extent of the reaction that you'd have, and with these massive plumes that happen on the icy moons, we kind of do know where to look because we know there's a hydrothermic system underneath. So I don't 100% agree with your argument there, Peter. The largest hydrothermal oh, event, not just casual water rock interaction, sorry. The largest volcano in the solar system is Olympus Mons, and that sits on Mars. How many hydrothermal events will that have had? Had, had, exactly. We're looking in the past. It might still be active. We don't know. And I don't want to throw something out here that I don't know. I'm only talking about direct observations. Okay, we're going to stop. 
Oh, sorry, we're going to stop that question there because we've got one probing question for you all mm -hmm. um, to to end this particular part of the um, of the event before we take our final poll. Um, so this question comes from Jeremy, and it's listening to the debate. It sounds like there are two slightly different questions that might each have their own answer. The first one is where are we most likely to find life, and the second is where theoretically is life most likely to exist. Um, maybe just a few seconds from each person before we do the final poll. Peter, would you like to go first? I would. I think Jeremy's won the debate by clearly defining questions. Um, I think that for Mars, I think is an incredibly likely place for life to have started. But obviously there's, you know, questions about whether it could have sustained it and survived right now. Um, and I will let the icy moons people say what they think about icy moons. Mark, would well, you like I, to go I, next? I was going to say, I think I think that's a really insightful question. And those are two different questions. You know, uh, detection and exi existence and detection are not the same thing. And um, but I actually do firmly believe that the answer is icy moons to both of those questions, because we don't need to go and find these environments hidden away. We can just go and sample those plumes, which are giving us a snapshot of the ocean that we know is habitable today. Susanna? We know that Mars is really Earth-like. We know that life exists on Earth and it has existed and evolved and left its traces in the rock. We know how to find them. And we also know that there is still water on Mars. It is in the underground and the um, orbiters have found it under the ice caps of Mars. So we still have liquid water on Mars these days. And while we might not find life where it is safe for a current spacecraft to land, that doesn't mean it isn't there. So in that sense, I think Mars is the, is the answer to both of these questions. So I'm going to take a little different tact on this. So you're going to, you know, I am going to say icy moons and the Mars people are going to say Mars. But let's ask the question a different way. If we did find life on the icy moons and we did find it on Mars, which would actually be the most scientifically groundbreaking discovery and it has to be the icy moons because it would have to have a, sing a separate genesis for life which goes back to my first point and I think we can just stop the conversation there and we'll move on to your questions Vic. Well it's not it's not up to you guys to make this decision I'm afraid this is this is one that's down to our audience so I think we're gonna in a second take our final poll and then after the poll each of the two teams will have two minutes each to respond to that so the poll, I think, is now on your screen. Um, so if you want to select. Oh, we've got a bit of fluctuation here. OK. Are our poll results in? Oh, okay, so our final poll result, drum roll. Um, in second place with 39%, we have Team Mars. But today's audience vote on where is life more likely is 61% is the icy moons. Um, I think I'll perhaps offer the next first two minutes slot to Team Mars to come back on that outcome. Uh, do we have to keep arguing or are we allowed to say what we really think? I think we just say <laughs> congratulations <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, congratulations. And um, I think we are in a fascinating uh, time because we can have that debate and we can actually all argue with spacecraft data, which wasn't possible just a few years ago. And um, for me personally, um, I have to say I study Mars and I, yes, I'm very passionate about Mars, but wherever we find life, I will be listening. And a very quick word, sorry, Peter, from the Icy Moon team before we write up, wrap up. I was just going to echo the exact same sentiment. Um, you know, it's, it's great fun to have these debates and this conversation, but we are at a point now where we have missions going to Mars and going to the icy moons that have the potential to make um, discoveries about, about the existence or not or the, or the non-existence of life. And I think that's really, really exciting for solar system science, for understanding our kind of place in, in the universe, really. So 
wherever we find life or, or not, um, it's going to tell us something about that. OK, thank you very much. We have a minute before we need to wrap up this event. I'm sorry to Peter and Karen for not being able to come back in on that. I'd like to say a massive thank you to our two teams of experts, Mark, Karen, Peter and Susanna. Um, I'd also say thank you to Louise for such a lovely welcome. And I'm hoping we've made a good haul at the uh, Times Higher Awards tonight. Thank you to all you Wales and the people behind the scenes that have been able to make this possible today. Helen Dare, Shabina McGann, Vicky Jones, Dean George, all from all you Wales. Uh, Hannah Cooper from Astrobiology all you and Rachel James from STEM Communications. And thank you to everyone who's come along today and asked some really probing questions and uh, resulted in glory for the Icy Moons team. Don't forget the recording's going to be on the Open Learn Wales website. Uh, you can rewatch and share it from there. And you can also find out more about the work of Astrobiology or you and uh, uh, the schools within the STEM faculty um, on Open Learn, particularly look for our Astrobiology collection. Um, in which case, I think it's time for me to attempt to say Dioch and Hoilvar. <laughs>